Well, hello. Thank you all very much for joining uh, this special edition of the podcast of the United Nations uh, University Merit. My name is Diego Salama. I work as a partnerships and liaison specialist uh, in, at UNU Merit. And today um, we're delighted to have the uh, visit of uh, Dr. Pedro Conceição, who is the director of the Human Development uh, Report Office at UNDP. Uh, Pedro since, uh, has been at the office since 1 January 2019, and he's the lead author of the Human Development Report, which we're going to discuss today. Prior to this, Pedro has had an extensive and uh, illustrious career at uh, UNDP. Most recently, he served as director of strategic, of strategic policy at the Bureau for Policy and Program Support. So, Pedro, thank you very much for, for agreeing to, to visit us virtually here at UNU Merit. We're very interested in, in hearing your thoughts and, and the main findings of the report. So let me start um, for uh, just for the sake of, uh, of, of an introduction. Can you please provide me a brief interview and a brief overview of what is the Human Development Report? Why do you make it? Um, and what, do you, what is the main outcome, uh, generally speaking? And then we'll, sp we'll speak about the latest edition. Sure, Diego, and happy to be here. Uh, the Human Development Report uh, started uh, almost 35 years ago, really as an invitation uh, to, to countries, to people, to, to take a look at the mirror uh, and make an assessment as to how much um, we were uh, able uh, to fulfill the aspirations uh, of enabling people to live their lives to their full potential. So it's uh, a different way of uh, uh, measuring progress, the progress of society, and a different way of assessing policies uh, that goes beyond um, looking at the performance of the economy, recognizing that the performance of the economy is obviously important, um, but uh, the idea that uh, development is multidimensional, has many aspects to it, uh, and that people aspire to, to many things at the same time. Uh, so uh, Human Development Report uh, um, typically has a theme uh, or uh, uh, tries to apply this human development approach to a particular th theme or topic. Uh, and it also um, in introduces or uh, um, puts forward a number of metrics associated with this notion of, of human development. So it's, um, it's an invitation for uh, all of us to, to, to take stock uh, as to uh, how our progress is faring when it comes to human development but also to uh, hopefully offer a, a fresh perspective on some of the development challenges that, that we confront. Fascinating. Now, now tell me um, if you could summarize briefly the findings of, of the latest edition. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, one of the ways in which we uh, try to, to convey uh, where we are when it comes to human development is by uh, putting forward a number of indices or metrics of human development. Perhaps the, the most well-known is the Human Development Index, which is uh, something that brings together um, uh, indicators related to standards of living, uh, but also achievements in health uh, and education. So I want to emphasize that Human Development and Human Development Index are, are different things, but the Human Development Index is a good um, uh, metric to understand uh, how we're doing when it comes to, to human development. So one of the key findings of our latest human development report um, is that the human development index, the global human development index, or the average human development index uh, for the world, um, uh, is now moving back up after uh, a decline for the first time ever in 2020 and 2021. Uh, but there are two very concerning aspects with, uh, with this uh, improvement in the Human Development Index. The first is that the path of, of improvement uh, falls below the trend line uh, that we would have observed had we not seen the decline in 2020, 2021. So there is sort of a gap between the potential Human Development Index and the, the, the path that we are on. And so if you project this forward, uh, this uh, represents a very long-term uh, loss in, in human development and human potential. So this is very concerning. And, and the second concerning aspect relates to 
uh, the fact that after decades in which the difference between the Human Development Index of the countries at the top and uh, at the bottom was shrinking, so we were in a process of convergence uh, in, in human development, uh, for the last four years, basically, since uh, we saw that decline, this gap is now widening. So we are witnessing a project, uh, um, a process of uh, divergence in the Human Development Index. Uh, and then the report uh, suggests that one of the key reasons as to why we are in this situation uh, relates to the fact that uh, the international community and countries are not... Um, uh, managing uh, well uh, interrelated challenges, uh, mm -hmm. uh, some of the interdependencies that we are confronting, and this was put in sharp relief in the context of the of the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic, which was a shared challenge by all countries in the world that uh, hit simultaneously, uh, and that required some sort of countries coming together in addressing it. and And the fact that um, we fell short in what needed to be done is one of the reasons as to why we uh, confront the trends that I alluded to. Uh, but perhaps more concerning, looking ahead, uh, the, the way in which we manage challenges like climate change uh, could either uh, move us towards a process in which uh, the divergence that we are currently facing uh, is reversed and we move towards a process of convergence, or it's actually uh, exacerbated. And finally, and maybe we can go in, in, into a, a bit more detail on this, Diego, if you, if you want, uh, is that one of the reasons why we had trouble managing these interlinked challenges uh, has to do, uh, we argue, with the context of political polarization, where countries um, are um, uh, divided uh, between very hostile groups, and, 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 and this political polarization is poisoning uh, the ability of societies uh, to manage uh, within themselves, but also across countries, uh, share challenges, these interdependent challenges that I alluded to. Yeah, I think this polarization, the, the let's say systemic, the, the, the systemic place where it's taking us is an erosion in the trust and, and, and even efficacy of multilateralism as a, as a core, as, as, as of course, multilateralism is one of the cornerstones upon which the entire bedrock of the UN system um, is, is built on. So and I was reading the, the, when I was reading the report, I, I also sensed the, 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 the urgency and the alarm bells ringing uh, in, in relation to multilateralism. So I wanted to discuss, I wanted to, uh, to, to ask, how is the crisis of multilateralism impacting human development? Particularly in, as you say, in this, let's say, triple planetary crisis that we're facing with inequality, climate. Um, uh, so how is this problem of multilateralism, this lack of, of confidence in it, uh, affecting human development? Well, what the report actually tries to ask the question uh, as to where does this lack of trust come from? Where does this polarization come from? Uh, because if, if we do... Um, uh, a, a diagnostic uh, as, as to the causes, the underlying causes or drivers, um, uh, that would give us a better chance of uh, addressing uh, the problem. So the, the crisis of multilateralism that you alluded to, in a way, is a reflection or a symptom uh, of um, these more fundamental challenges uh, uh, that, that, that uh, are reflected then in, in lack of trust and political polarization. So according to, to our analysis, much of uh, the underlying drivers are related to perceptions of insecurity. So it's less about uh, objective standards of living as measured by the Human Development Index, for instance, but more the fact that um, there's a pervasive sense of uh, lack of, of security uh, around the world. According to our estimate, six out of every seven people around the world feel insecure about some aspects of their lives. Uh, and there's also a difference in the intensity uh, 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 with which people feel insecure. And, and so we find three uh, important correlates of, 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 of insecurity or degrees of insecurity. We find that the more insecure people feel, the less they trust others. So here you find a connection between perceptions of insecurity and uh, lack of trust. We find that the more insecure people feel, the more attracted they are to the extremes of the political spectrum. So you find also uh, an association between perceptions of insecurity and um, um, 
um, polarization. And we also find that the more insecure people feel, the less uh, they feel in control of their lives. So this idea of being in control of one's life is very core to the human development approach because human development is about having a broader understanding of well-being that goes beyond uh, the performance of the economy, as I alluded to, but it's also about this notion of agency, of human agency, of people feeling empowered to shape their lives and be in control of their lives. So um, one of the reasons, in summary, uh, as to why we are confronting the, the challenges of paralysis or gridlock, the gridlock that the report uh, uh, speaks about in the title, uh, uh, has to do with these uh, widespread perceptions of insecurity. That's uh, very, very interesting. And of course, with all the processes coming, uh, like the summit of the future, and and there are some, and there, there there seems to be this big push to defend multilateralism as a cornerstone. Um, now, it, it, I think this very interesting question that you discuss in issues of trust. So I think trust as a whole is is very interesting. How can what do you think are the necessary steps that can be taken both at the national but also international levels to restore trust in in multilateralism and multilateral institutions and uh, everything they stand for? So I, I think it goes back to understanding the reasons and the drivers uh, for the lack of trust. So if our um, analysis is, is valid, is correct, that a lot of it has to do with these perceptions of insecurity, uh, 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 then I think we need to find ways of enabling people to feel more, more secure uh, um, and more uh, in control of, of, of their future. Um, I would also say that uh, obviously we face a context uh, in which um, there is geopolitical upheaval, um, processes of geoeconomic fragmentation uh, and the way a violent conflict um, by some measures uh, unprecedented uh, since the end of World War II. Um, but within this context, I think it's important to recognize the uh, that it's inevitable for the international community for countries to address shared challenges. Um, so climate change is an example of a challenge that cannot be addressed at the border. It requires collective action. We met, we learned through the COVID-19 pandemic experience that uh, managing of, of pandemics also requires the same the same set of uh, international collective action. So uh, I think it's important to recognize that it's inevitable, even in a context in which so many uh, things divide countries and divide our societies, uh, uh, that uh, we need to find ways of identifying arenas of cooperation in, it, in which we need to come together. And what the report uh, offers is uh, a way of making these arenas of cooperation very concrete by uh, mobilizing the notion of global public goods. So these are um, um, uh, things that uh, uh, from which every country can benefit at the same time. So they are not zero sum. Uh, these are things in which countries uh, do not need to compete. There are many things in which countries need to compete and will continue to compete. Uh, um, but uh, the provision of global public goods offers uh, a way of identifying those arenas of cooperation in which countries come together. And I, I think it's happening. Uh, um, uh, and we can think of some examples in which we see some progress, not with the intensity and the speed required, but at least some some signs that uh, some things are at least moving in the right direction. And you mentioned the summit of the future, and I think this is an opportunity uh, to, to bring even more visibility and salience uh, 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 to the recognition that uh, countries do need to come together to address these shared challenges and hopefully find ways uh, uh, forward uh, uh, on them. And on a, on a personal note, are you are you hopeful that the summit of the future has the that there is the political momentum necessary to discuss uh, root like some of the root challenges uh, and some of the the much needed reforms, uh, for example, to the international financial architecture. This, uh, for example, as as evidence in the uh, in the policy briefs uh, drafted by the Secretary General. Um, in which there there is a call for the summit of the future to be a, a cornerstone moment in which we we not only defend multilateralism for for what it's worth, but we also tackle some of the shortcomings 
that uh, that the system has. So do you think this is the uh, we have the political capital, the political will, and the necessary vision in order to make the summit of the future what we're hoping it it to be? I think the the current context is one where uh, there are difficulties. They are obvious to to everyone. I mentioned geopolitical upheaval, geoeconomic fragmentation. But you ask about hope, and I think hope is about, in my view, uh, fighting, fighting for um, uh, improvements, fighting for what's, uh, um, what we need to do to address this, this shared challenge. So in that sense, yes, I'm, 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 I'm hopeful. Uh, a different question is the likelihood, so uh, the probability in which uh, we were going to have a, a, a right uh, outcome or not. Um, uh, but I, I think if we if we don't have hope, we do, if we don't retain this aspiration of of improving and fighting for the things that uh, we believe are needed, um, uh, then that is very demobilizing. So uh, I'm personally uh, hopeful, rec but clear-eyed, recognizing the the difficulties, um, and uh, and I think the issues are on the table, uh, ranging from not only the ones you mentioned, but also uh, to how we. Uh, deal with the uh, with the the challenges and opportunities of a digital transformation that is unfolding uh, uh, before us. Um, um, climate change uh, is another example, but on both of these aspects, we actually see some uh, um, signals in which countries uh, are actually coming together. Even countries that have very strong disputes on many issues. Are actually uh, finding ways of uh, of coming together um, and at least engaging in a dialogue on how to address these challenges. So yes, I think I, I, I'm hopeful. And speaking of moving forward, so the, there are a number of immediate action areas that the report outlines. Uh, so planetary public goods, digital uh, global public goods, financial mechanisms, and governance approaches. So the report seems to outline, well, it does outline a blueprint of this is, these are the immediate actions that we're going to take, and these are the things we are taking, but this is where we need more support, we need more commitment. Can you tell me a little bit more about the action areas and what uh, called, so how can the rest of the UN system support UNDP in this, in, in this quest, but also how can the member states um, cont contribute and, and even lead the uh, achievement of these action areas? So I think there are basically two uh, platforms uh, in which um, we can we can look at actions to uh, break away from the gridlock. Uh, one has to do with the ways of easing polarization uh, within societies. Polarization uh, has been increasing uh, over the last um, ten years or so in over two thirds of the world's countries. So it's it's uh, it's really something that is poisoning the the ability to address shared challenges in many countries around the world. And then this is translated also into the international context. Um, so one way of, of easing polarization uh, has to do with the importance of recognizing that often people that seem very far apart agree on more than they think. So one example that we cite in the report uh, relates to um, beliefs around uh, climate change, uh, which is one of the issues uh, that in many societies has, has been polarizing um, in the sense that some people believe that we're doing too much, too, too quickly, and others that we are not doing enough and we are too slow. Um, and yet, uh, when people are asked, uh, this is a globally representative survey, if they would be willing to make a personal financial sacrifice to address climate change, almost 70% of the global population responds that they would be willing to make a personal financial sacrifice to mitigate climate change. Uh, and uh, when they are asked the second question, if they think that people around them share the same belief, then the percentage drops from about 70 to a little over 40%. So this is important because it, 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 it suggests that even though people are individually committed to addressing a shared challenge, global challenge like climate change, uh, they think that many around them are not. And this matters because for um, challenges that require collective action, it matters not only how much we individually are committed to address exactly. something like climate change. I'm, I'm sure you are, Diego, as I am. 
Uh, but if people think that others around them are not, then this has a demobilizing uh, uh, effect. So I think this is one of the areas in which we can uh, we can do a lot. Uh, and the second, perhaps more on the international context, and to go more directly to your to your question, uh, has to do with the um, with the recognition that many decisions can be made uh, to calibrate the extent to which our economies and societies are connected or not. Uh, so you mentioned international financial architecture. So there are decisions that can be made about how much we allow capital to flow across countries, for instance. Uh, trade, similarly, we can make decisions on how much goods and services can, can flow uh, across countries. But what I, I think uh, we need to, to recognize is that there are at least two drivers of interdependence uh, in which uh, decisions at the border are limited in being effective or uh, are completely uh, ineffective. So one has to do with the reality that we live on a shared planet. So on a shared planet uh, 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 that is changing rapidly, not only as a result of climate change, but also by diversity loss and other ways in which we are seeing a number of planetary changes that are unprecedented in the evolution of our planet in, in human history, uh, these cannot be managed at the border. They require collective uh, action. Uh, and so they require the provision of global public goods of a, of a specific kind, the planetary public goods that you alluded to. And then there's a second driver that has to do with the um, uh, connection of human societies and economies uh, 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 via digital means, uh, the digital transformation I, I alluded to. Uh, and of course, here there are some, some things that can be done at the borders to limit the flow of information, but it's difficult, it's hard, it's expensive. Uh, and so it's important to um, uh, find ways of mitigating the risks that these new realities is, is, is presenting and enhancing uh, the, the, the manifold opportunities uh, to advance development that come along with this digital transformation. This is an area in which many parts of the United Nations, including UNDP, have done a lot of work on uh, in collaboration with uh, other sister agencies. Um, and it's also, as, as we know, one of the topics also um, for consideration during the Summit of the Future. So I think there's a, an, a, 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 it's important to recognize that at least in these two dimensions, um, we need to find ways of, of coming together because decisions at the border are not going to be sufficient. So when it comes to planetary public goods and digital public goods, if you want to use that language and frame. I think it's very interesting, both at the national and, and even international level, this idea, and also well, as you were saying with the survey, that we have to we have to break away from this notion that we, we, we seem to be expecting less and less of each other, uh, but we are willing to commit ourselves. And I think that that's fundamental and that can be extrapolated both from the individuals, you and me, all the way to the UN system and to the member states discussing this. We have to expect as much commitment as we give and we have to give more. We have to give all the commitment that we expect. Uh, and instead of making it a vicious circle, we need to make it a, a positive um, feedback loop because otherwise uh, otherwise uh, we are going to be like, like stuck. And we need to really... Um, evolve to a positive feedback loop. And I think the, the report does a really good job in outlining how can we move forward uh, and, and, and what are the different steps that we can take in order to uh, to address the, the, the urgent collective needs multilaterally and with an awareness and understanding that actually global interdependence doesn't necessarily need to be something bad or something that hinders national sovereignty or even national agency to make decisions. I, rather, it, it actually helps us make decisions that we cannot make. Because of course, as we say, uh, there's this uh, really old saying, politics is uh, ends at the water's edge, but, uh, but neither climate, neither sustainable development, neither any of the challenges we face today, like stop at the border or at water's edge, actually they increase. And the moment we do, the moment we are, uh, hopefully this report and all the all the uh, momentum that we're facing, the, that we're seeing this year with the Summit of the Future actually helps us. Um, uh, because I, one area that uh, that particularly strikes me um, from the from the key findings is this uh, this idea that of, of uneven progress. And the fact that on the one hand, yes, uh, 
the 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 HDI is uh, has reached record heights in wealthy nations, but it's low in pre-crisis levels in the half of the poorest countries. So, taking this into consideration, how do you think we can, uh, or can the system support the member states and so on to even that out? So uh, to to ensure that this uneven progress at least uh, starts to move towards a more even uh, even keel. So I think it's important uh, again to recognize uh, what what's behind uh, this uh, uh, this divergence that that we are now seeing. Um, uh, so one way of looking uh, at divergence or looking at why um, uh, countries are not moving forward as quickly as others is to say, well, they don't have enough enough resources, and and that motivates the transfer of resources from rich countries to poor countries, and that remains true. So uh, uh, official development assistance is insufficient. And on top of that, we have a number of uh, humanitarian crises associated to a large extent to, to the uh, increase in conflict, uh, violent conflict that I alluded to. But what uh, the experience over the last few years also showed is that if we do not manage these interlinked challenges, um, uh, this this is uh, one of the key drivers for for this this divergence. So even if you provide all the resources that we can think of for countries within themselves to do everything that needs to be done and that's right to do, they would still be vulnerable to shocks emanating for from the inability to manage these interdependencies. So I think that's a key lesson from the the COVID nineteen pandemic. Because remember the twenty thirty agenda. Um, has the pledge to leave no one behind and reach the furthest behind first. Uh, and yet the evidence, uh, not only from the Human Development Index, but from other publications, uh, shows that actually we are seeing now a process of divergence, where actually the poorest and most vulnerable of our community are being left uh, behind. So in addition, we suggest to uh, uh, official development assistance, it's important to allocate resources to managing these interdependent challenges. Um, so COVID-19 gives us a glimpse uh, of um, uh, what has happened looking back, looking into the rear view mirror. But we also provide in the report evidence about what might happen looking forward, looking towards the future. If, for instance, we don't um, uh, mitigate climate change. And one of the implications of not mitigating climate change looking ahead is that we will likely see an explosion of inequalities in human development. Uh, and we provide some, some estimates uh, of projections of uh, changes in mortality rates from now until the end of the century in countries at different levels of the Human Development Index. Uh, and what this shows is that the countries in which there's going to be an increase in mortality uh, are those that have the lowest levels of the Human Development Index. And then the higher the level of human development index, the lower the increase in mortality rate. So this it will result in a, an explosion of inequalities. So looking ahead, uh, our inability to manage these, these shared challenges could be uh, a, a driver of um, a diver, a further driver of divergence. Yeah, and and what new financial mechanisms can we can we discuss? Uh, to support low-income countries and how can they be effectively implemented in order to ensure that actually the ones furthest behind are the first picked up by by human development? So, so it's about our ability to manage the, these these shared challenges, and a lot of the action has to to take place uh, in high-income countries. Uh, but flows of resources uh, uh, to uh, low and middle-income countries uh, also have to be then on the basis of these countries' contributions to these global shared challenges. So if you're asking a country, a low-income country, uh, to make a contribution to uh, something that is desirable from an international perspective, the country will benefit, obviously, um, but it's also contributing uh, to something that is collective. So one way of thinking about this is to, to suggest that at least the, the difference between the benefit that accrues exclusively to the country and that that accrues to the international community should be uh, supported by international transfers. So this is um, 
uh, a way of thinking about the potential, we call it the third track of development financing, complementing traditional development financing and, and humanitarian assistance. Okay. Let me um, ask you, uh, let's take a, a little bit of a step back and let's say long term or let's say medium term. What is your vision for or, or how do you, what, is, what outlook do you have personally for the future of human development? And what critical steps do you think are necessary uh, in the next five years to take in order to ensure, as, as we said before, that the furthest behind are the first picked up and that we even the keel of, 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 uh, of human development? So I, I think it's um, uh, about completing the uh, unfinished agenda uh, of um, reducing inequalities and eliminating poverty um, uh, and closing the gaps on what in the 2019 Human Development Report we called basic capabilities. So even though the gaps in basic capabilities have been narrowing, uh, if you think of uh, things like um, child po child poverty, for instance, um, uh, or even extreme poverty, despite the uh, uh, um, uh, challenges during the COVID-19 period is, is, is something where we see uh, progress. Um, uh, that agenda is still unfinished. So I think that we need to redouble the efforts, if you will, uh, to reach the last mile of exclusion uh, and deprivation. Uh, but in addition, I think that we need to uh, consider two uh, aspects. One, and I already spoke about, is the fact that the threats to human development emanate from the way in which we manage these church uh, challenges, these interdependent challenges these interlinked challenges. So it's not only about supporting countries in their national efforts to reduce poverty, for instance, but also in redoubling our efforts to uh, address shared challenges like um, climate change. Um, and the other important uh, aspect to consider is to recognize that even though when it comes to these basic capabilities, inequalities are perhaps shrinking, even though they haven't closed fully, we're also seeing gaps widening in what we call the enhanced capabilities. So the new opportunities uh, for um, um, as we go deeper into the into the 21st century. Uh, so this is uh, concerning because uh, uh, this is where we see uh, that there is um, an increasing gap between aspirations for human development for many people and and the effective opportunities that people have to seize on on these opportunities. Very good. I have two more questions. Uh, number one, uh, on a personal capacity or on, on your personal opinion, what did you find the most striking or concerning with relation to this year's report? It was the divergence. I didn't expect to see the divergence uh, and I didn't see the furthest uh, behind being left even <laughs> further behind. Uh, so when uh, I actually first saw the numbers, I couldn't believe them. And I... Um, asked my colleagues to take another look uh, to make sure that we got it, that we had gotten it right. Um, because this is really, um, there are not many things that change dramatically uh, when it comes to human development, because many of these uh, indicators that we rely upon uh, tend to be relatively slow moving. So when you see a dramatic change like this, really a reversal in trend, uh, that was uh, uh, very, very surprising to me and very, very concerning. Uh, and I don't think there is enough recognition uh, in the international community and the debate as to how momentous uh, this shift uh, this shift is. Okay. And to, to conclude, um, what final message would you like to convey to our colleagues in the system, the member states who are going to meet uh, in the summit of the future, um, and, and, and more broadly speaking, civil society? What would be the message you would like to convey or uh, from the report and from the way forward that, that we have uh, discussed? Well, maybe two messages. First is um, the importance of uh, uh, recognizing that development is about people. So we care, we care about people. Uh, and uh, uh, the importance of uh, asserting the human development approach, uh, that it's not about the economy, it's not about the interests of specific countries, is about how uh, people are able to live lives to their full potential. That should remain 
the focus of the way in which we uh, uh, assess progress and evaluate policies and the decisions that we make, including the way in which we allocate resources. And, and the, the second uh, important message is, is to recognize that prospects for human development um, are more and more shaped uh, not only by what countries do within their borders, but also by the way in which we find ways of cooperating uh, across borders. Um, and this is not going to go away. Uh, again, we can make decisions on how much we globalize when it comes to the economy, how much our economies are interdependent. Um, but we uh, will remain on a shared planet uh, that we need to, uh, to manage uh, uh, together, um, a planet that is changing as a result of uh, pressures that we, by our choices, are, are, are making, on, uh, that are making life more dangerous uh, for many people and are driving these patterns of, of divergence that I alluded to. So if we fail to recognize this and to act upon it, um, uh, the patterns of divergence that we already undergoing are likely to be exacerbated. Well, uh, that's a very, very good message to conclude. Thank you very much to Dr. Pedro Conceição, the director of the Human Development Report uh, Office at UNDP, for joining this uh, special edition of the UN Numerate podcast. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Diego. It was a pleasure.